Hi, this is Allison Sheridan with the Silicast Podcast, hosted at podfeet.com, a technology geek podcast with an ever so slight Apple bias. Today is Sunday, May 5th, 2024, and this is show number 991. This Tuesday at 7 a.m. Pacific time, Apple has an announcement widely believed to be for a new set of iPads. I have my hopes set on an OLED 12.9-inch iPad Pro, so my little eyes and ears will be glued to this announcement. If you'd like to join the friendliest bunch of folks in the live chat room during the announcement, I hope you'll join us by going to podfeet.com slash chat during the announcement. As usual, Steve and I will not be in the voice channel since the real fun is in the announcement, not hearing us yap. We hope to see you there. This week, I had a blast on Clockwise 552, hosted by Micah Sargent and Dan Morin. On the show was co-guest Jeff Carlson, who I'd never met before. He's a tech author and a podcaster. And uh, in this 30-minute action-packed show, we talked about what features in iOS we'd like to see improved with generative AI. You know, that's what Apple's going to be talking about, supposedly, at WWDC. So it's kind of fun to use our imaginations and think about what would we like to see iOS be able to do. My topic was about the process each of us followed to cure home networking issues and how long is it before we actually call for help. Our answers were curiously similar, which was basically the last resort is to call for help. Then we talked about the probable upcoming iPad announcement and what it would take for each of us to buy a new one. It was kind of funny. Jeff Carlson actually said he felt guilty because he's not going to buy one. And I suggested that, you know, the stock really does need his help. Finally, we bemoaned the recent problems Apple had caused so many people to be locked out of their Apple IDs. And we pondered whether having so many eggs in that one basket is really a good idea. I have to say, I... Don't want to say I took pleasure in other people being locked out of their Apple IDs, but you remember a week and a half ago, I said, hey, this seems like it's on Apple server sides when it happened to me, and then it happened to everybody else, so I think it's probably still connected. Anyway, as always, you can find Clockwise in your podcatcher of choice, and there's a direct link to episode number 552 in the show notes at Relay.fm. If you've been listening to me for any length of time, you know I'm a huge proponent of doing a nuke and pave of my Mac also known as a clean install, pretty much around once a year. You can just search podfee.com for nuke and pave to read all of the articles I've written on this subject over the years. I definitely believe in doing a nuke and pave when I get a new computer. Now, when I say nuke and pave or clean install, I mean installing every single app one by one and configuring every little bit of it by hand. The only thing I bring over from a backup is my data, no settings at all. I'm a bit unusual in how much I tailor my Mac, so this is a very lengthy process. I'm not going to go into all the details because I've described how to do it as recently as last October. The downside of this process is that it takes me about five days on and off to get everything working properly. But the upside is that everything is predictable. Because I've documented my apps and settings before I start the process, I know how much work I have to do. I break it down into the mission-critical apps and settings, important apps and settings, and then the ones that I use, but they're not that critical, and maybe they can wait for a bit. It's a daunting task, to be sure, but I find the rigor of the process pleasing. But this week, I strayed from my tried-and-true process. After fighting with Apple for 12.7 months about the massive battery drain on my M1 Max MacBook Pro, I broke down and bought a new M3 Max MacBook Pro. I realized that if I used Migration Assistant to move all of my apps and settings and had them exactly the way they were on the older Mac, it would give me a unique opportunity to prove to Apple once and for all that it was not my apps and settings causing the problems. This was pretty much my first time using Migration Assistant in ages. I have to say, I've been shocked to find that Migration Assistant is anything but rigorous and predictable. Everyone always talks about Migration Assistant as though, you know, it just works. That sure has not been my experience. Let's walk through just a little bit of the fun I've had. We'll start with apps from the Mac App Store. Those, if anything, should have come across seamlessly, but several did not. I use Mars Edit to write all of my blog posts, so it's high on the mission-critical list. When I launched Mars Edit for the first time after the migration, it asked for my license key. Well, that didn't make any sense because I would bought it from the Mac App Store. I tried to just download it again from the Mac App Store, but I got a different error. It simply said, unable to download app. So that was swell. I contacted Daniel Jalkut, developer of Mars Edit, and he explained that he stores all of the settings in separate files and they don't get deleted when you delete the app. 
Luckily, Hazel wasn't working yet, so its app sweep of the trash didn't delete those files when I deleted Mars Edit. Now, I don't know if something healed in the Mac App Store, but after Daniel's email, I was able to download Fresh from the Mac App Store. Now, Mars Edit is one of the most well-behaved apps I use, and even Mars Edit from the Mac App Store doesn't gracefully transfer with Migration Assistant. I mean, this means I'm doomed if something as good as Mars Edit doesn't work. Now, Telegram is my messaging app of choice, and while it worked, I had no avatars for any of my contacts. One of the joys of Telegram is that you can create these cute little avatars for groups, too, which means it's easy to see at a glance who you're talking to. Searching a long list of names was a terrible experience. I uninstalled and reinstalled Telegram from the Mac App Store several times, and I finally just gave up. After about four days, my avatars came back. I have no idea what caused the problems, but I'm sure glad that the picture of a glass of wine is there for my Wine Wednesday chat group in Telegram again. Let's see, who's up next? Mac Tracker. This is an awesome app that lets you learn everything about every Mac, iPhone, iPad, or accessory Apple has ever made. And you know what? It decided it didn't want to function after Migration Assistant either. It popped up a dire warning with a yellow triangle with an exclamation point inside of it, and it says, MacTracker.app is damaged and can't be opened. You should move it to the trash. Well, I sure didn't want to throw away MacTracker, but I had no choice, so I selected Move to Trash. The next pop-up was even worse. Now, instead of a warning, I had a scary red stop sign with an exclamation point and a new warning that said, MacTracker.app could not be moved to the trash. So... <laughs> Come on, guys, this is Apple's Mac App Store, Apple's downloader, presumably Apple's warnings, and of course, Apple's migration assistant. I dragged Mac Tracker into the trash, and the operating system asked me to authenticate, and it worked. Only then could I download again from the Mac App Store, and it worked as designed. When I tried to launch the delightful window manager, Moom, from the Mac App Store, I got the same dire warning that it was damaged, and the red stop sign telling me I can't throw it in the trash. I didn't even try to fight it. I dragged it into the trash manually, authenticated, re-downloaded, and Moom was back working again. But why, Apple? Why do I have to do this? I use an app called AutoMounter to mount my Synology volumes automatically. This lets Hazel clean up my audio files for the podcast by moving them to the Synology without my intervention. But AutoMounter comes from the Mac App Store, so of course, things did not go well. It was slightly different from Mac Tracker and Moom's warnings. The pop-up said it was damaged and couldn't be opened, but it didn't bother to offer to send it into the trash for me. On a lark, I didn't delete AutoMounter. Instead, I went to the Mac App Store, searched for AutoMounter, and I simply clicked the Open button, and that worked. No uninstall, no authentication, or reinstall required. I have no idea why this worked. And remember, I tried this method with MarsEdit, and that didn't work. So I can't even even find a pattern here to the way these things are breaking. I don't understand why all of these apps were damaged, but it's obvious to me the blame is entirely on Apple because this many developers didn't screw this up. So that's it for the Mac App Store fails that I've experienced so far, but the Mac App Store apps aren't the only ones giving me fits. Let's move on to whine about what apps are the apps that aren't from the Mac App Store. Probably the worst of my apps to have trouble making the great migration of 2024 was Backblaze. This is a terrific offsite backup service. It's not on my mission critical list because I have local backups and most of my data also lives in a syncing solution, you know, iCloud uh, Drive, Dropbox, or Google Drive. I obviously want it to work, but I tend to wait a little bit to start backups when switching machines until I'm sure everything else is migrated properly. Before the migration, I had my M1 MacBook Pro and my M2 MacBook Air backed up to Backblaze. I launched Backblaze on the new M3 MacBook Pro with the intention of inheriting the license and backup from the M1 MacBook Pro. But when I brought up Backblaze, it was a hot mess. And it's hard to even describe what a hot mess it was, but I'm gonna try. The opening window had the Backblaze logo in the center, but every word on the screen was error dialogues. For example, the center said, error underscore main dialogue underscore top banner underscore initial backup paused. There were three buttons labeled error main dialogue button, followed by something I couldn't read because it was falling off the button. There were unformatted error messages on the right. There were links to errors. Like I said, it was a hot mess. Obviously, a reinstall of Backblaze was required. Now, 
I probably should have followed their uninstall instructions on the Backblaze website, but I forgot that they were there. In any case, they're quite arduous. They have an uninstaller, but they say to run it and to do this deep dive into all kinds of library preferences files and delete things. I really think their uninstaller does the work, but they don't tell you that you don't have to do both. In any case, I took the easy path and I reinstalled and Backblaze worked just dandy. Now, I sent a copy of the awful screen I saw after the migration to the Backblaze folks, just kind of as an FYI to explain that their software didn't graciously migrate. I explained that I'd gotten past it by reinstalling, so this was just to warn them. At that point, I successfully adopted a backup on the new M3 MacBook Pro. Well, a few days later, I start using the M2 MacBook Air, and a window popped up telling me Backblaze is no longer working on this Mac because the license had been taken by another Mac. That's when I realized that Backblaze never asked me which backup to adopt. It didn't take the one from the M1 MacBook Pro, it took the one from the M2 MacBook Air. Well, the folks at Backblaze worked with me to get this sorted out, but it took about eight emails back and forth, much discussion before we were able to get Backblaze to ask me which backup to adopt. It also involved deleting several now dead backups through the Backblaze web interface. I never had to do anything like this before when I got a new Mac and I did a pave from scratch. Now, Dropbox was almost as big of a mess as Backblaze, and I'm not entirely sure I have it completely sorted yet. The first symptom was pretty normal by now. macOS told me simply that the application Dropbox.app can't be opened, and it had an OK button. Not as alarming, but it still wasn't working. I went to the website and I downloaded and installed a fresh version of Dropbox. Before I can explain what happened, I have to refresh everyone's memory on how cloud storage providers work with modern macOS. Last year around this time, Adam Angst of Tidbits fame was on Chit Chat Across the Pond Light, and he talked to us about Apple's changes to how cloud storage services are implemented in macOS. Apple dropped kernel extensions, I think for security reasons, and they created a new file provider extension. Now that's all the under the hood stuff. From a user perspective, what we saw was the cloud service apps moved from being kind of top level citizens to showing in the left sidebar together under locations. All of your files for cloud storage services are actually now in, in your home library cloud storage. Now that's an interesting location since your library is a hidden directory by de default. This was one of those resistance is futile situations where you pretty much had to go along with this change. Now, I had long since allowed Dropbox to adopt the file provider extension before I migrated to the new Mac. I checked Dropbox a few days after I made the migration and noticed that none of my Dropbox files had migrated over to the new Mac, and they hadn't downloaded from the Dropbox servers either. That's when I realized that Dropbox was not using the new file provider extension. From the menu bar app, I had to go through the dance again to let Dropbox make that transition. Now, that seems really odd. It was set up that way before, why would, why would it have not migrated that way? I then had to keep tickling the Dropbox files to get them to download to the new Mac. Nothing came down on its own. I had to keep right-clicking, saying, yes, download this whole folder, download this whole folder, download this whole folder. Finally, things seemed to be downloaded. By the way, I know I, I, know I have it set correctly to download all files locally, because that's what I want. So uh, last week, Bart and I recorded Chit Chat Across the Pond. When we record the show, we do we both do what's called a double ender recording. That means I record my voice locally and his voice from Zoom. He does the same thing on his end. He records his voice locally and my voice on Zoom. When we're done, he moves his recording to a shared Dropbox folder. Then I pull both double enders into my recording software Hindenburg. I delete my Zoom recording of him and his Zoom recording of me, leaving two good directly recorded voices. This is a way of ensuring that if either of us has a problem recording, we at least have one copy of both of our voices, but if we both succeed, we get two really good recordings. After Bart said he'd successfully uploaded his file to Dropbox, I told him I said it never came down. You must have done something wrong. Well, we occasionally have hiccups on one end or the other with his transfer process, so I suggested he check again. He sent me screenshots and all indications on his end were that it should be on Dropbox ready for me to see, but it still wasn't there. I wondered what could be wrong other than a bandwidth problem on my end. I opened Find Any File, my favorite way to do deep searches on my Mac, and discovered that I now have two copies of Dropbox in, t in my home library cloud storage folder. One of them is called Dropbox, and it has the pretty logo, and the other is called Dropbox 42324 7.08 p.m., and has a generic folder icon. 
Now, this isn't an alias, but I found a couple of those too. It was a complete duplicate of all of my files, 122 gigabytes worth. Now, I was able to finally clean that mess up, but our Bart Allison share folder in Dropbox that I had in my left sidebar was pointing to that wrong Dropbox, which is why I could never see Bart's file. How terrifying is that? I rely on the app Hazel from Noodlesoft to do a lot of work on my Mac. I've already mentioned how it does an app sweep of the trash for me to get all the weird little files off my system, and I use it to move local files to my Synology when they get stale. This is a fantastic application with great support from the developer Paul Kim, but for some reason on this new Mac, having just used Migration Assistant, my rules are were all fractured. I'm getting errors when I open the app, errors when I try to save a rule. I've got runaway circular jobs going on, so things get copied from my Mac over to the Synology, and then they get copied back. And Paul and I have been going back and forth. I've been making videos for him now uh, since... Uh, Hazel rules sync between my Macs. Now it's broken on my other Mac. It's just completely polluted and it's a, it's a hot mess again. And I know that Paul writes good software and this shouldn't be happening. The only difference in the way this happened was because I used Migration Assistant. Now, would you believe that even Apple's developer tools don't work after Migration Assistant? In order to test web apps on iOS during development, like with the work we're doing in Xcape Pass WD, I use the Xcode Simulator. That lets you bring up a fake iPhone or iPad on your Mac, and you can see how your web app looks and acts at different sizes and orientations while you're doing the development, not using the real website. When I tried to run it for the first time on the new Mac, after Migration Assistant's help, it gave me a pop-up that told me I need to install additional required components. It wasn't hard to fix, but why on earth did only part of Xcode come across with Migration Assistant? If anything proves that this is all Apple, it's got to be that example. Now, while the problems I've discussed were huge and took a lot of my time and were incredibly unpredictable, I was more tolerant but still surprised that basically none of my security settings transferred over. Every single app that wants to use the camera or the microphone or even record the screen like screenshot apps, all of them had to be reapproved. Every app that wanted full disk access had to be reapproved. Every app that uses accessibility had to be reapproved. Also in the security category, Rogue Amoeba has a new way of getting permission to hijack audio, but not all of their apps use this new audio routing kit or ARC method just yet. That means to use their older audio capture engine, you still have to boot into safe mode and lower the security settings. I'm not surprised I had to do that one by hand rather than Migration Assistant doing it for me, but it was still annoying to do. Another th weird thing is a lot of apps lost their launch and login status, and that makes no sense to me. Is I, I don't see how that's security related, but that kept happening. Finally, I was annoyed at the software I had to move manually because of the way they're licensed. That's not Migration Assistant's fault, but you know what? I'm on a roll airing of the grievances here, so I'm going to whine a little bit. Parallels Toolbox is licensed per machine, but at least it lets me pull a license from another machine. I don't have to log into the old one and let it go. Setapp is licensed per machine too, and it's pretty expensive. So I did have to release the license on the old Mac first. Glad I didn't trade it in before he did that. ScreenFlow has a Mac App Store version, but it's really cost prohibitive. A license of version 10 on the Mac App Store is $170 every time they come out with a new version, whereas an upgrade of my standalone license was only $59. So again, I had to release the license on the old Mac to retrieve it on the new one. The bottom line is that I'm not convinced Migration Assistant has any advantages over Nuke and Pave. For me, it's been a lot of work cleaning things up and getting them working properly, and it's been no fun at all. The unpredictability of the problems was really not what I was hoping for, and I do not understand why everyone else talks about it like, oh, it just works. But guess what? This just in. Homebrew's broken. After I thought I'd discovered every failure of Migration Assistant, I went to install something using Homebrew. The that's a command line package manager. I think an app store, but it's for command line tools. I got an error telling me that ownership and permission for the location of homebrew files was not writable and that I should change the permissions back to my user account. Luckily, it also told me the command to do that. It wasn't hard to do, but again, it was annoying. It also suggested that I make sure my user has write permissions to that same directory and gave me those instructions. Like I said, it only took a few seconds to fix, but it's one more paper cut because of using Migration Assistant this time. And 
Tonight, when I got, sat down to do the live show, I used Keyboard Maestro to do a whole bunch of stuff on my Mac, open files, open uh, applications, shut down other applications, turn off Wi-Fi, and move a bunch of uh, the windows around on my screen so they fit nicely for the live show. And let's see, the error it's giving me right now says, preference shared sync write failed, and a yellow banner. So that's nice. What you're about to hear next was my favorite interview from the CSUN Accessible Tech Conference. It's with a gentleman named Spiro Kularis, who co-founded a company to solve a real problem for him and which will greatly benefit others. He is absolutely delightful and funny, and I really hope I get to see him again in real life. I'm with Spiro Kularis and... Alex Alan Cantwell. Cantwell in the Autonomous Living Technologies booth, and Spiro's going to be demonstrating for us, and I, I should tell you, this is a podcast, an audio podcast and video, so I'm going to probably stop you and describe things that I'm seeing a little bit here. So uh, you're in a wheelchair, correct? I am. I was diagnosed with ALS in 2019. I've lost the use of my hands and upper limbs. Okay, so you've got on a pair of glasses and some little transmitter receiver sort of thingy is, is connected to your glasses and you're actually going to be controlling this Mac out in front of us. Is that correct? Um, it's the beginning. Um, I control my Mac. I control Windows, iOS, and Android devices. And my goal, when I'm at home, I won't be able to get up in the morning and do everything I want to do without saying, honey. <laughs> it, it's strange. I found that people with disabilities want to do the same things everybody else wants to do, which is weird, right? Who thought? Who knew? It all started with the fight over the remote control <laughs> for the TV. Um, I'm a sports junkie, and she's not. <laughs> that's how it got started. Okay, so uh, can you tell me, what is the thing called that's on your glasses? Um, we have built a device that we call Kato. Kato, C-A-T-O? Yes, and Kato is an assistant for me to help me do everything. It's originally inspired by the character Bruce Lee played in the Green Hornet. Oh, right, right, right. So, okay. So Kato is a psychic. Um, on the screen, you can see when I move. So you're moving your head back and forth, and we're seeing a yellow circle with, a, with an arrow in it move as you move your head. That's right. And so it's, it's not following your eye gaze, it's following your head motion, correct? It tracks motion. Um, eye gaze is an important technology, but we're an alternative. And the thing I can do um, with my device, um, in my environment at home, I want to work on a multi-screen set up with an iPad, with my main computer, and with my auxiliary computer. So I'm always moving screen to screen, and there's no eye gate system that can do that. So this is working over Bluetooth, is that right? It connects by Bluetooth, but the the key thing driving it is motion, an accelerometer, a gyroscope, and machine learning software we wrote that can learn gestures. So if I nod my head or tip my head, I can trigger a command. I want to be able to use this with people that have different disabilities. So it can connect not only in my head, but also on my foot, on an elbow, or on another body part. 
So whatever somebody's got, let's find a way to transmit that information. You got it. And I want to show you how to tap and raise a lift. Okay. If, if I wanted to get in and out of bed, it's a cat. There you go. All right. So what's he doing over there? He's got a cat? Well. Okay, I don't understand what's going on. But we've got a cat in a basket that he's hung over. So there's, this is very confusing. <laughs> but I'm sure this will be uh, obvious in a moment what you're about to do. Okay, this cat is going up and down on a tether. It's a uh, little stuffed cat. It's not a real cat for the listening audience. They aren't, no animals were harmed in the making of this movie. The same device I'm using to control my TV and my computer, I can use to control a lift in my bed. Oh, no way. No way. Oh, that's that, cool. That's the cool part. I don't need to keep switching technology to do different kinds of things. If I have Alexa, I can use the Alexa on-screen app because she doesn't understand my voice anymore. Oh, okay, right. So for somebody non-verbal, we can now provide control of a computer base and other devices from one interface. That's crazy. So you can make the cat go up and down right now for us? I can't right now here because we have it set up on different devices. For oh, okay. the show, we want to do two samples at once. Okay. But you can see over there, the device Alan is using is the same as the device on my glasses. Oh, okay. So I'm going to step over to Alan for a second. So Alan has the uh, Cato in his hand. And... Oh, wait, we're interfering. They're both... Both Catos are controlling things? No. Um, he was paying attention to you. Oh, and he didn't notice he wound up the cat too much? Huh? <laughs> okay, this is a funny demo. I like this. Okay, so he's tapping the uh, Cato and it's going up and down. A single tap is bringing it up, a double tap takes it down, and a triple tap stops it. Okay, okay, I see what you're doing there. All right, I want to see you open something on your Mac here, Spiro. Okay. Prove it to me. I'll prove it. Um, first, I'm going to turn on my camera. Okay, so he just reached up and tapped on a Alt-P for the uh, camera? Yes, in the Mac world... They have something called alternate points of actions. And you can see stuff moving back and forth. Oh, you're doing that on purpose? A, a no, screw I'm windows? Not. Oh. <laughs> I'm talking. Oh. Uh, and it's reacting to you? I turn them off when I want to talk. Because opening my mouth with a camera on is a left click. Oh, okay. So with the camera on, that's now your, it's looking at you with this transmitter and, and yes. the you're talking? Oh, wow. And now, if I turn the camera on, you'll see it turn on. Okay, how about if I do the talking and I'll watch what you're doing. So, expression tracking restored, it said. So you're watching a basketball game is what I see you doing. <laughs> All right, he's went over and he opened Chrome. And uh, now he's going over, oh, he's going to move the, oh, he's grabbing a window and moving it. Oh, wow. That's all with just gestures with, with his head. So now he's gone over, he's got Gmail up. We're going to read his personal email here in just a second. See, I can say whatever I want. Oh, he's composing. He's composing an email. Wow. And he's about to uh, type in a, uh, a subject for this. And he, so he's got an on-screen keyboard, and he's looking around, and we see a, 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 a yellow uh, circle with a, an arrow, and he just wrote, thank you. Wow, I didn't even notice how fast you did that. That must be with some type-ahead uh, prediction. 
All right. This is, yeah, you are absolutely doing everything uh, I would do, except you're spelling better than I do, I think, the way you're doing it. Okay, this interview, uh uh-oh, is terrible. What is he going to type? So far it says this interview is, all right. Oh, well, he he called it. We'll never know what he was going to (laughs) say. All right. Uh Uh-oh. You're not bringing up Photoshop there. Okay. Okay. Um, So you can watch movies on Apple TV? So I can do everything. I can bring up FaceTime, have a FaceTime call, Zoom meetings. Um, Wow. Put put the MacBook screen halfway down. Okay. So he's closing. Oh, because it's covering up your icons, right? I make phone calls with Google Voice. He's bringing up FaceTime. Oh, there's Steve. (laughs) You need to hunker down there. Is now a good time for me to uh, ask the uh, question I was supposed to ask over here of Alan? Yeah, it sure is. All right. I'm supposed to ask Alan, what are you doing uh, for kids with Cato? Well, with kids, we're working with school systems, and in some cases it's middle school, some cases high school, even some colleges, but we help them get access to the different applications still using Cato. An environment like Spiro uses for his home lab can be applicable for kids doing their homework and their ability to access maybe social media, maybe educational tools, things like Google Classroom. And too often, what they're provided is just a single tool with uh, challenging access to it. So not only do we put a wireless mouse on their glasses so they can interact with the tools, um, but they can toggle between different applications they would need. Uh, Many school districts in California are doing independent living labs as well. And that's where we go in with an IT environment and help simulate what somebody could do at home when the kid is home after school and help the parents understand the art of the possible there. That's that's crazy. So um, the product is called Cato, C-A-T-O, Autonomous Living Technologies, and it's A-U-L-I dot T-E-C-H. Ollie dot tech. Is uh, Ollie dot tech. How, uh, is this for sale yet or are you still prototyping? We just completed beta trials on the prototypes We have a release candidate we'll do another round of beta trials with during Q2, so that'll start mid-April. And we're working specifically with school districts, with occupational therapists, assistive tech pros, as well as healthcare professionals. And assuming the beta trials go well, we should be released by the end of Q2, primarily focused on uh, healthcare professionals later in the year, direct to consumer is the hope. Okay, so yeah, starting direct to consumer might be tough because uh, you got to have somebody to train and set up and understand how exactly. it works. Exactly. So within occupational therapy could could be the connection. Yeah. This is very cool, Spirit. Sounds like this has really opened up a lot of things for you that maybe you thought were gone at this point. Um, I live my life at full speed, and that was the main motivator. Um, I don't want to slow down and. Is my little fight back against the ALS. Well, it sounds like you are, and I'm sure you're going to be successful. This is fantastic. Thank you both for meeting with us. Thank you for taking the time. Okay, you see what I mean? You see why this was my favorite interview at CSUN? I love Spiro, and again, I sure hope I get to see him again soon. Hey, want to make a podcaster smile? Consider making a one-time donation to help support the show. While Patreon is the gift that keeps on giving, PayPal donations are really swell too. If you're feeling like the show is giving you value, consider going to podfeet.com slash PayPal and showing your support in a monetary way. This week, I re- this week, I received a review unit from Kensington for the Thunderbolt 4 Dual 4K Nano Docking Station. But I'm not going to call it a docking station. I'm going to call it a hub. In order to make any sense at all when I do that, let's talk about the difference between a hub and a dock. You may remember that during our trip to MacStock outside of Chicago last year, Steve and I got to visit the OWC factory with folks like Barry Falk and Dave Hamilton. It was great fun and there was a Q&A session before the tour. 
I figured who would be better to clear up the definition of a dock versus a hub than the folks at OWC, so I asked them to explain the difference. The biggest takeaway from their response was that there is no clear differentiator between the two terms. The best the gentleman who answered me could do was to tell me how they define the two. They mostly use the term hub to describe devices that multiply the same kind of ports and docks to describe devices that give you a bunch of different kinds of ports. For example, OWC sell an 11 port Thunderbolt dock that gives you three Thunderbolt 4 ports, four USB ports, Ethernet, audio, and a card reader. So that's a dock because it adds more types of ports. But OWC also sell a Thunderbolt hub that takes one Thunderbolt input and gives you four Thunderbolt ports. It also does give you one USB-A port, but let's not quibble about that. They still call that one a hub. Dave and I were delighted to have this cleared up, even though we knew it was an ephemeral definition. You can even find examples on OWC's site that don't quite follow this definition. So for the duration of this review of the Kensington device, I'm going to refer to it as a hub, because like the OWC Thunderbolt hub, it multiplies the number of Thunderbolt ports plus a USB-A port. Now let's talk about the problem to be solved by Thunderbolt hubs. Basically, you have too much stuff to plug into your computer, so you need more ports. While a dock could solve the same problem, I don't think they're always the best solution. Because when you buy a dock, you're getting the set of ports the manufacturer decided that you need. Maybe you don't need an SD card slot, but you might get one with your dock. My CalDigit TS3 dock has a DisplayPort connector on the back, and I've never needed it. A Thunderbolt hub is something pretty amazing. As I explained in January of 2022 in my article entitled The Wonder of Thunderbolt Hubbing with the OWC Thunderbolt Hub, before Mac OS Big Sur on the Mac, you could only daisy chain Thunderbolt devices. You couldn't multiply the number of Thunderbolt ports. I'm not sure when Windows joined the party, they may have even been there earlier, but I suspect it was with Thunderbolt 4 that tightened up the spec to make Windows and Macs in parity. Thunderbolt ports are pretty magical. They can be anything you want them to be. Unlike a dock with a hardware-defined port, say for Ethernet, SDR, SD cards, and HDMI, a Thunderbolt port can be Ethernet. It can be an SD card reader or a video signal carrier. Maybe you just need a bunch of disk drives plugged in. But I need a Thunderbolt mic interface, but someone else needs a card reader. We all get exactly what we want in a much simpler device. Now, I actually use two Thunderbolt hubs. I've mentioned the OWC hub, and I use it to add more ports to my desktop setup. It's connected to one Thunderbolt port on my CalDigit TS3 Plus docking station, and it gives me three Thunderbolt ports and one USB-A port to plug in all of my recording nonsense. Now, you'll notice that only increases my Thunderbolt ports by two, but I only needed two more ports at home. The OWC Thunderbolt Hub costs $140, and I wrote about it in the article about the wonder of Thunderbolt hubbing. When I'm on the road, I use a CalDigit Element Hub. This hub is $200, and it gives me three Thunderbolt ports and four USB-A ports. In my write-up in July of 2023 about it, I explained that it allows me to do the live show on the road using only a MacBook Air instead of my MacBook Pro. I nearly fill up that little hub with all of my devices. Now, technically, I could probably do the show without it, but if I did, I wouldn't have a good camera, I wouldn't have a professional microphone, I wouldn't have lighting, and I wouldn't have a secondary display, so I could see my recording software and the show notes in the live chat room all at once. When Kensington offered to send me another Thunderbolt hub, I knew it would be fun to check out and do a comparison study of the CalDigit and OWC offerings. The Kensington hub provides three Thunderbolt 4 ports that provide 5 volt 3 amp power. The Thunderbolt port that goes to your computer provides 65 watts of power. That makes the configuration pretty similar to the OWC Thunderbolt hub, except the OWC is rated for 5 watts less at 60 watts of power. The Kensington hub is the only one of the three that has a power switch. That might be a quick way of turning everything off if that's something you need. It also comes with a 0.8 meter passive Thunderbolt cable. A passive cable is one that doesn't contain any electronics to boost the signal for data transfer speeds. In general, you can maintain 40 gigabits per second of data transfer on a passive Thunderbolt cable, but a longer cable would require electronics to maintain that speed. I put a link in the show notes to what's the difference between active and passive Thunderbolt cables at Pluggable Technologies. The Kensington Hub is a nice compact brushed aluminum package that's less than 5 by 3 by 1 inch. 
Just like the other two companies' Thunderbolt hubs, it comes with a large power supply that kind of takes the fun out of how light and small the hub itself is. Makes me wonder whether all these companies could be using GAN charging to lighten the load a little bit. The Kensington has two lights on it, one to indicate power is connected, which is pretty common, but the second light is unusual. The icon looks like a chain lock, but it's actually an indicator of whether the device has been connected to a computer. I've mentioned that the OWC is $140 and the CalDigit is $200. Well, the Kensington SD2600T comes price-wise smack dab between the other two at $180. One of the primary purposes of a Thunderbolt hub is to allow you to run multiple high or high resolution displays. The Kensington can run dual 4K displays or a single 8K display at 60 Hertz. But boy, the technical writers really had to tie themselves into knots to try to explain how that works on a Mac. I don't blame them because Apple has made this very confusing. After explaining quite simply that Windows host devices can have a single 8K or dual 4K displays at 60 Hz with no disclaimers wrapped around it, they had to say M1 slash M2 slash M3 base chipset MacBook or USB-C alt mode laptop supports only a single external display. Now, that's really confusing, but again, it's not their fault. I know what they're trying to say, and this might be confusing to some. In Apple's support article, how many displays can be connected to a MacBook Pro, they try to break it down simply. In order to follow the bouncing ball, you have to remember that MacBook Pros can be configured with one of three chips. The basic chip, which has no moniker at all, the Pro chip, and the Max chip. The M3 MacBook Pro with no moniker can only support one display, external display. But the MacBook Pro with M2 Pro or M3 Pro chip can support two displays simultaneously. If you drop the extra coin for an M3 Max MacBook Pro, you can use up to four external displays. But what about normal people with, say, MacBook Airs? It gets even weirder. In the Apple support article about MacBook Airs and external displays, it says that the MacBook Air can support only one external display. But in the very next sentence, it says that if you have an M3 MacBook Air, you can support two external displays if the lid is closed. So if you've been able to follow this at all, it means that an M3 MacBook Air can support two external displays with the lid closed, but the basic M3 MacBook Pro cannot. Now, I've heard that Apple are actually going to be updating the M3 MacBook Pro, the nameless chip one, to allow it to also support two external displays. But from what I've read, that hasn't yet happened. And it's expected that it's not going to be like a hardware update. It's going to be some sort of firmware update. So now do you see why the technical writers at Kensington had to tie themselves into knots trying to explain this? In an experiment that has probably no value to anyone listening, I connected my M3 MacBook Pro Max to the Kensington dock and then connected the 6K Pro Display XDR and the 4K ViewSonic USB-C display. The MacBook Pro Max was able to drive both monitors. When I swapped the MacBook Pro for an M2 MacBook Air, it could not drive both monitors at the same time. And while researching how to explain this odd limitation on the number of displays, I discovered a way to learn how many displays your particular Mac can support. If you open System Settings, in the menu bar, not the window itself, select the Help menu. One of the options will be a link to the tech specs for your particular Mac on Apple's website. I'm really surprised I never noticed this before. In there, you can actually see how many displays your Mac can support. I ran a lot of experiments with the Kensington Thunderbolt hub between my MacBook Pro and my MacBook Air, and at one point when I switched devices back to the MacBook Air, neither of the connected displays came back on. On a lark, I tried the power button on the Kensington hub, and I did the old turn it off and turn it on again, and that did the trick to tickle the displays and they came back on. While it would have been preferable not to have that moment of panic, I was glad the Kensington Thunderbolt hub had an easy button to cycle power. The bottom line is that the Kensington Thunderbolt 4 Dual 4K Nano Docking Station 65 Watt PD Windows Slash Mac OS is a solid offering in the Thunderbolt hub space. It's not as capable as the CalDigit Element Hub with three more USB-A ports, but it's also $180 versus $200 for the CalDigit. Other than the extra 5 watts of power delivery and the power button, it has pretty much the same form factor and capability of the OWC Thunderbolt Hub. 
However, the OWC is $40 cheaper at $140. I don't think you can go wrong with the Kensington Thunderbolt Hub, but it might be more than you need to spend. There's not a lot of pet technology here at CES, but I've come across something called Pawport, and we have Martin Diamond to show us a smart, secure pet door. Is that right? That is right. And I'll tell you what, it is a tech product. We're at CES. But the real magic of this product is that it is a retrofit. So if you have a standard pet door, which looks like that, or just a normal hole in the wall, you can slide your paw port on top of it and transform what was an old, kind of unsightly pet door into a smart pet door. And suddenly you've got all the functionality of a smart home product that you control from a phone, from an app. Uh, you can schedule different pets' access, times of day, times of night that you want your pets to come and go. It can control multiple schedules for multiple pets. So you can choose which pet gets to go out when. So how does it, so what I'm looking at here yeah. is uh, two gray doors and it says paw port on top yeah. and I see a bunch of LEDs up on top. Of so yeah, so the LEDs on top are the manual controls on the product, right? So you have a basic open close. That's going to let you just manually open it. If you just want to leave your door open all day long, that's the way to do it. So are we looking at the inside or the outside of the door right now? Because it came out towards us? You're are we in out? the inside. You're in your inside. home. Okay. Yep. So, we're so in our, we're in our family me. room and it comes in. And your okay. dog would go out. Now, that is a manual operation. You can lock the door from here as well and do some other things with the lights. But the real magic is this collar, the paw port collar and collar tag. This is what allows pets to come and go. We've got this model here and kind of our, our other model here. So we're on the radio, remember, yeah, here? Yep. So we've got a little tiny dog with a red collar that's somehow different from the other collar. Yeah, well, there's two different collar adjustments. This is our own Popport proprietary collar. It's the strongest collar you can buy, and there's no bulk. A lot of people are concerned when you add a tag to a collar that you're going to build on some bulk to it, Especially and your dog's going to carry dogs. it around. Exactly, exactly. So this, this is very uh, lightweight and in line. It doesn't add any bulk to the collar. It's part of the collar, basically. And this dog is not, he's not allowed out here. That's not his house. He doesn't live here. This dog isn't going to get out this door here. The door behind me is what, where he lives, and so when he wiggles, that door will open in front of that door. So the dog opens the door based on the schedule you set in the app, uh, based on the controls that you set up uh, for him to exit or come and go. Okay, so you can have multiple pets and yeah. are some, like one dog's allowed out during the day and one only, the other one can go out at night? Yeah, I mean, setting a curfew, a lot of people don't want animals going out at night, so you right, set a right. curfew for them. Uh, sometimes you want to keep your dog outside. Let's say you have a, a housekeeper or guests over and you don't want them to be disturbed. You can actually keep your pets outside. So you can set up whatever schedules you want, multiple schedules, multiple pets. Uh, it also has a lot of safety. You'll watch when I do this, if the dog wants to go outside, and now he's thinking, oh, wait, it's raining out and the door closes on him. It'll just sense that and kind of bounce right open. As you see, the door's hitting my hand and bouncing right open like that. Nothing doesn't hurt. It's like two I pounds. wish elevators did that. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's exactly right. Uh, so a bunch of things. And then in the app, you'll see here our app. The app allows you not only to schedule the door, but also to track your pet's activity. So the door knows whether the pet is coming from the inside or the outside, and it will track whether the pet is coming inside or outside like that. And you'll get a report at the end of every day. You get alerts. Anytime your dog opens the door, you get an alert on your phone saying that, you know, your dog is inside, your dog's outside. You'll see how long he's been outside or she's been outside. And all of that is controllable and configurable in the app. Uh, as well as the lights that are on there that, that people love. That's very cool. So Pawport adapts to your existing doggy door, yep. if you will. Retrofit. And um, is this uh, available today or when's it coming out? It is coming out May 1st. Very good. What's your price point on the Pawport? The base Pawport, which is not this one, right? This one has a few things to uh, we'll talk about. The base Pawport is a painted finish, a composite resin, no battery. 459 is your starting point. This is a model that has uh, is dressed up with our, our wraps. It's all aluminum, extremely solid, very strong and durable. Has our battery pack in it, which is also extremely large. It fills the door. And that model here is 749. So how is the one that doesn't have a battery, how is that powered? Is it wired? We have a power port right here. You can plug it in on the left side. You can also hardwire it through the back. There's a charge port behind it. 
It allows you to plug into the back and do a, a hard wire. So if you want to have no cords visible, you can do it that way. Um, you also have the option, if you never want to plug your door in to charge it, uh, you have the battery, as I said, inside the door. You can just lift that up, pull it out, and, yep, and put another battery in, either swappable. So you don't have to charge this product. If you never want to plug it in, you put it somewhere not near an outlet, just swap the battery and it'll always be online and running for you. Very cool. Where would people go to find Pawport? Pawport.com. There we go. P-A-W-P-O-R-T. And thank you very much, Martin. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Well, that is going to wind us up for this week, but don't forget to join us on Tuesday morning for the Apple announcement. Again, that's at podfeed.com slash chat to chat with all your little friends from the NoSilla Castaways. Did you know you can email me at allison at podfeed.com anytime you like? If you have a question or suggestion, just send it on over. Remember, everything good starts with podfeed.com. You can follow me on Mastodon at podfeed.com slash Mastodon. If you want to listen to the podcast on YouTube, you go to podfeed.com slash YouTube. If you want to join in the conversation, you can join our great Slack community at podfeed.com slash Slack, where you can talk to me and all of the other lovely no silly castaways in there. You can support the show at podfeed.com slash Patreon, or just make me happy with a one-time donation at podfeed.com slash PayPal. And if you want to join in the fun of the live show, head on over to podfeed.com slash live on Sunday nights at 5 p.m. Pacific time and join the friendly and enthusiastic Nocilla Castaways. Thanks for listening and stay subscribed.